Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Monday, October 3rd, 2022. I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Marie Helen Beal. Marie, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Marie, to start, Just... would you please tell me your current title and institutional affiliation? Well, right now I don't have an academic title. Um, I was a... Um, a, clini a, 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 a clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at UCLA for a number of years. Um, I then went out into private practice and um, I was a uh, first, it, UCLA has this complicated way of, of designating things, but because I had the same title, but I was no longer compensated by the university. And that's mostly a teaching appointment. Um, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, UCLA informed me that my um, that they no longer needed out, outside uh, uh, teachers. Um, through the back channels, I heard that they had a, actually I think it's probably still going on, they had a gynecologist who was accused of uh, abusing patients. Yeah. And they, they, they just decided they wanted to have people that they knew really knew and could control um, with their with their students. Um, but I've, I'm also you know, about three quarters retired at this point. Um, I have a, I am affiliated with a practice. I do a lot of the scheduling and that kind of thing and keeping the, uh, the younger doctors kind of pointed in the right direction. But that's... Marie, what does 75% retirement look like to you in a given week? Are you going into the office? Are you taking new patients? I'm taking, well, uh, I, we do a consultative practice. So we, yeah, we take new patients because it's, it's, it's obstetrics. It, it, change, it, it changes over all the time. Um, I work on average about one day a week. I and, cover vacations, so sometimes it's a lot more. But, and, yeah. and did you start after your separation from UCLA? Did you start a private practice, or did you maintain one throughout your time at UCLA? I did not personally retain one. I was uh, working at um, uh, the county hospital at Harbor, which is a UCLA site, and the people who work there are UCLA faculty. Um, we had a department private practice and there was a point where there was one of those um, uh, academic upheavals that people who don't work in academics don't understand <laughs> and and they you know they deposed the chair and they I was at that point the vice chair and they gave me the side eye pretty strong and I said you know I'm just I'm out of here at that same time they decided they didn't want to continue with the de department private practice so uh, one of the hospitals where we had been working called me up and said, uh, would you be willing to just come yourself? So that's how kind of it started. So it was not my practice before, but it was certainly something I had been working in and, and knew about. And it was comfortable. Um, it was also in your 50s is a crazy time to go out on your own. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the state of California had a law that said that, that you could COBRA for two years because nobody would even give me a quote for health insurance um, because of some some priors that I was like, really, seriously, you know, I know this isn't really a problem. So what are you talking about? Um, but um, um, it all eventually, you know, we got it, we got a couple other people and then we could have a group um, health plan. And I my my insurance was still incredibly expensive, but at least they, they couldn't tell, they didn't tell me I couldn't have it. And uh, uh, that was the most exciting part about going out on your own. <laughs> it was like, I knew I could make money. I just didn't realize I couldn't get insurance. So, Marie, spending so much of your career with an academic affiliation at UCLA, did that influence the kind of medicine you practiced? And did you ever get involved in, um, you know, more fundamental research kinds of work? Um. Yes and yes. Um, you know, in uh, I was at uh, the Westwood campus for several years, and there, this is 
this is one of those things that I think is different for medical school because in med in a medical school setting, you're expected to bring in uh, to see patients because that's what brings in money, but you're also expected to be doing research. And the guys who were the most, or the people who were the most successful at um, uh, getting tenure were the ones who managed to convince the house staff that they didn't know how to take care of patients, so they were never um, bothered. Um, in OBGYN, if you're a woman, you already are a patient magnet, no matter what you do. So uh, it was it was difficult at Westwood to get any time to to do anything serious. When I went down to Harbor, Harbor weirdly, because it's the county, had a much more uh, extensive lab than in uh, than Westwood did. There's a long story about that. Part of it is that Harbor was the original UCLA hospital before they built the University Hospital in Westwood. And I apologize if you don't, if you're not an LA person, you don't follow all this stuff. <laughs> um, uh, so um, Harbor had this big lab. They had multiple different animal projects going on. And so for a while I did um, research on, or I, I, I worked on a project with mice um, who were uh, aquaporin deficient. The uh, question being aquaporin, uh, aquaporins are uh, water membrane water channels. And the question was whether the aquaporins were responsible for regulating the amount of amniotic fluid. So um, it had a whole, whole project. That, unfortunately, after about three years of doing this, we weren't getting any significant information so that kind of petered out but that's what happens when in research sometimes um there is still reason to think that aquaporins are involved but the model i was using was just not not doing it um which i will expand on if you have any interest in that <laughs> no please please tell me um the the animal model that had been used the most for looking at aquaporins regulating um amount of, of things in the in the embryo were uh, Xenopus ova. Xenopus labus is a, I think it's the African clawed frog, but it's a, or toad, but it's a an amphibian that lays big fat eggs and, and they've used it to, well, I had mice. I had mice who were aquaporin deficient in various, in aquaporin one. And it occurred to me that the mouse embryos are not much bigger than frog eggs, at least big frog eggs. So we were taking the embryos out and putting, I had a whole device that I that I developed that I built to put individual embryos in so I knew which one was from which um, mother. And then we, we'd um, sort of incubate them in the, in whatever fluid we were using and see if the, if we could tell the, the difference in terms of how much water was absorbed into the embryo. Um, it was, it was a semi-clever idea. Unfortunately, after a bunch of fooling around, it didn't really work all that well. So that's where that's where we got. You know? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it just got I, I couldn't generate enough data to get uh, research support. My that, that was an expensive thing to do without that. So eventually, I kind of gave it up. Um, in a academic medicine setting, you always do. Um, uh, clinical research. And we actually had a, a project at one point where um, we were trying to figure out how you could be back up. When babies are born, they can get stuck halfway out. It tends to get uh, called a shoulder dystocia with uh, the theory that the shoulder gets uh, stuck behind the, the pubic bone. And and the baby and and it can be get, it can be life threatening for the fetus if you can't get it released, and there are various maneuvers that are that are um, described. Um, but one of the questions was, you know, how good are we at, at actually deciding what's in, what's a shoulder dystocia and can we um, uh, objectively d define this? So we, me, and a bunch of research nurses stood in the back of the room with. Uh, many deliveries and timed the events of the delivery. 
And, and what you found was that there was a, the two standard deviations from the mean for a normal delivery was a, between the delivery of the head and delivery of the shoulder was a minute. And so if it went on for long than, longer than a minute, this was sort of objectively an, an unusual delivery. And this was true whether it was um, the intern doing the delivery or the attending or the midwife. Midwives tend to have a whole different philosophy about how you do this kind of thing, but still didn't matter. If, it, if things were going as per usual, the baby got delivered in that amount of time. And so then we could start looking at what, the plan was to start looking at what things actually made a difference in terms of improving the, the, um, the time if you had a baby that was getting stuck. And I, that may still be going on, but it was a project I, had, I worked on for a number of years and then somebody else took it over. Marie, what's the decision tree from medical school and residency, the level of specialization for an OBGYN? How do you how do you make those decisions ultimately leading to the things you're most interested in doing professionally? Well, I went to medical school. Now, my father was a professor of medicine, um, you know, a very senior person. And... Uh, Internists, medicine doctors, in in an academic sense, tend to think that the OBGYNs are brain damaged. Uh, you know, it's the old joke is that you take the bottom ten percent of the medical school class, and those that can bench press a hundred pounds um, go into orthopedic surgery, and those that can't go into OBGYN. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, this is sort of before there were a lot of me uh, women in medicine. And I won't say that that was my father's actual opinion, but it was just, um, but um, um, so I was at Caltech and I took the medical school, the MCAT, which is the GRE for medical school basically, and did very well on it. Um, and the MCAT, at least at that time, was real it was wildly variable it had a, a whole section on things like organic chemistry and then it had a whole section that was sort of general knowledge and it liter literally asked you questions like which artist is famous for statues of ballerinas what direction is rio de janeiro from buenos aires that one i was like i know where they are from here you know? <laughs> so so um this is not the kind of thing they do anymore because it's so so culturally biased. But um, so I did I did quite well with the with the MCAT. My father was really impressed, and at the, about the same time, the pre medical advisor at Caltech was a guy named Lee Hood, who had gone to medical school at Johns Hopkins. I don't believe he ever did an internship, and. Um, had gone to Johns Hopkins sort of because Caltech wouldn't take him back as a grad student because the department's, at least what I was told was that the department's um, position was that, you know, we've taken most of the courses and met most of the profs here and go go learn something else, you know. And uh, so his his um, advice, he was the, the pre-medical advisor, his advice was don't do it. So um, I didn't really, have a lot of thoughts about um, going to medical school. And then um, there were two guys that I spent most of my time studying with. And one of them was just a little bit better than I was. And he, you know, got it faster. Um, and he wound up at Rockefeller as a uh, institute as a PhD. Um, the other one was not smarter than I was, my opinion, but was willing to work 25 hours a day. And he actually wound up going to medical school himself after being a PhD for a little while and wound up as a pathologist, which is somebody who goes to medical school who doesn't really act actually want to see people. <laughs> so. <laughs> And uh, so um, the, the difference, so, so I said, well, let me, let me think about medical school. I looked into MD PhD programs, which was probably more me thinking that PhD was a more legitimate academic degree than anything else. But the, 
um, the bigger MD PhD programs, there was one at University of Chicago and I interviewed there, but they didn't take me. There was one at University of Washington, but they didn't um, accept people from outside of their geographic area um, because it was a state school. So I wound up and I, I, um, I applied to UC San Francisco. They didn't take me. Not really sure why. Um, applied to Harvard because everybody applies to Harvard. They weren't interested. Um, and then I applied to, to UCLA. UCLA took me. A little awkward because my father was a professor at UCLA, but oh well. Um, and then in medical school, you go through, you rotate through the various clinical um, subjects. So you spend, at least in the second half of medical school, you spend a few weeks on medicine and a few weeks on surgery and a few weeks on um, pediatrics and a few weeks on OBGYN and a couple of weeks on neurology and a couple, you know, all of those different kinds of things. And many of them are, many of them are subjects that you've never really thought about the 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 thing i was most interested in going in was genetics most geneticists are pediatricians but pediatrics is one step from veterinary medicine because you can't at least most pediatric patients you can't really talk to about what's going on with them mm -hmm. um so that didn't appeal um in the middle of i guess it was summer between first year or third second year and third year of medical school I did a lab project where one of my jobs was to um, take blood from the tails of rats. So I was I was extremely popular as a medical student on peds because I was the only one they'd ever met who could actually draw blood on a baby. <laughs> it was very similar. They're screaming at you and they're jerking around all the time. But I didn't know. I could start IVs. I couldn't tape them down so the baby couldn't pull them out. So the intern would say to me, get it in. I'll tape it down. <laughs> But um, um, so then I did OBGYN, not thinking anything, you know, it was such a cliche, women, women doctor are going to go into OB, save women. And I just, I loved it. It was when I was in the hospital on another service and nothing was going on, I go up and hang around on, on the OB floor. They thought it was crazy, but um, so just sort of unexpectedly, that was what I really loved. And I loved Gynecology is fine, but if you just want to be a gynecologist, you might as well just be a general surgeon. There's more variety. Um, the 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 thing I really loved was delivering babies, and uh, I um, so I did my residency in, at Columbia in New York, and the guy who was the residency director was a character, not in the sense that he was inappropriate or anything, but he was just a, a, a single guy about 50 years old, massively overweight. Um, and, you know, who, who, who was one of these people who never told you you were doing well, just told if, if you didn't say anything, it meant you were doing fine. <laughs> and, uh, but he was a, he was trained as a maternal fetal medicine specialist. So I got interested in that. And, um, uh, Nowadays, maternal fetal medicine is all about um, ultrasound, taking baby pictures. But that was right at the beginning of um, real-time moving picture ultrasound. So that we didn't, nobody I think really knew what direction that was going to go at the time. But the other thing that the maternal fetal medicine docs did was to um, basically take care of a lot of the medical complications in pregnant women. Because not all, but a lot of internists start running the other way when they find out the patient's pregnant. So, so um, um, we do a lot of the diabetes and the hypertension and the thyroid disease and the, the sort of the five biggies because it's just easier than trying to involve an internist who's trying to escape all the time. Um, so I did. I decided to do maternal fetal medicine. The biggest MFM program in the country at that time was at USC. Um, a big city hospital will do about 3,500 deliveries a year. Um, the really, the really biggest ones, maybe 5,000 USC, the biggest year that they had when I was a fellow 
did 17,000 deliveries a year. Whoa. There were two other hospitals in the country that were anywhere near that size. Now, mind you, there was supposedly a hospital in Caracas that did 50,000. So there, there was many bigger things. But the, the deal was in those days, even in California, people who were not citizens and certainly people who were not here legally um, didn't have medi access to Medi-Cal. And so they were they only got um, treated through the county hospital. And there was a huge flux of immigrants. And we had so many people that in fact, the county finally started um, contracting with other hospitals to take the easy patients. So we had 17,000 deliveries a year, but we also travel, we also transferred 10,000 out of the emergency room to other places. So it could have been a lot worse. Um, the, the, in California at that point, under a Republican governor, um, they decided that it was cheaper to offer undocumented pregnant women medical coverage than it was to take care of the babies afterwards when they had complications. And babies are all citizens if they're born here. So um, that's, it's still not true in many states in this country, but it's, it's, it's actually a source of some smugness on my part because it's like, oh yeah, we can do, we can do that. <laughs> now, there was a certain amount of craziness because you had people who were only covered when they were pregnant. So you're always trying to slip in somebody's heart surgery while they were pregnant. But, um, but that was, and part of the fun of that was that when I've worked in private hospitals, you knew that most times if the patients went another 10 feet down the hall, they could find an equally um, uh, an equally good doctor to take care of whatever it was that they wanted. Um, the the county in those days, we were it. You know, we were on the front lines and there was nobody standing behind you. <laughs> and so we just, you did the best you could. And this has nothing to do with science. It just had to do with kind of trying to deal with day-to-day -day stuff. There is a... Um, pregnancy condition called preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure that comes with pregnancy. There are certainly uh, uh, forms of that that can be life-threatening, but the things that usually happen are, are moms whose blood pressure goes so high they have a stroke or they go into heart failure or something like that. Um, the first two months that I was at USC, we had three ladies rupture their livers with preeclampsia which I realized after the first one actually is a described complication, but I had not only never seen it before, I had never heard of it before. <laughs> and I, it was just sort of like, whoa, what kind of place is this? But that was what you had. You had people who didn't have any care, who didn't have any, any ability to get care. They came in and you kind of had to deal with what was going on. Um, the rate of maternal mortality is in the yeah, about one per hundred thousand. There are a lot of, lots of doctors who've never seen one or have seen, you know, been around when there was one during their careers. Um, and I have to say, I, I did, was not personally responsible for a lot of these patients, but of course, when this kind of thing happened, you all knew about it. Um, we used to get five, six a year. And um, in those days, it was many of it, many, much of the time, it was people who just hadn't had the opportunity to come in early enough. Mm -hmm. But um, there were plenty of other things that happened, some of which were, were inevitable and some of which shouldn't have happened. But the, the, the um, there's an old saying that um, good judgment comes from experience. Mm -hmm. Experience comes from bad judgment. Right. <laughs> um, you just hope that it's somebody else's bad judgment. <laughs> so whenever something bad happens, you have to kind of like pay attention and say, okay, that's what I'm not going to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, 
we sort of it I'm sure that there are lots of things about this that horrify people who aren't in medicine, but we were truly and honestly doing the best we could. And and we thought we were saving more people than otherwise. Um, but, and, and even, at, even at USC, they don't have that level of relaxed supervision anymore. And in fact, they're only doing about 2,500 deliveries a year. So it's a completely different kind of place than it used to be. Marie, did you get involved in the gynecology aspect at all, or you stayed always with obstetrics? Um, as a fellow, I stayed always with obstetrics. In fact, USC was such a big service that when um, at night, there was always one attending on call, although the attending was frequently a fellow. But there was one on call for OB and one on call for GYN. Um, the GYN attending to call from home, the OB attendings were always there. Um, so when I went subsequently to U at UCLA, um, there would be one attending on call. And so I would get called in for um, GYN cases, but they're not cancer cases that happen in the middle of the night. They're, they're usually you know, ruptured ovarian cyst, bleeding ectop, something that is fairly straightforward surgically to handle. And that's what we did. Um, but um, anyway, back up a little bit from UCLA. I spent two years as a, as a maternal fetal medicine fellow at, um, at, UC, at uh, USC. And then I was offered the opportunity to do a fellowship in medical genetics, which I kind of jumped at. And so I did a genetics fellowship, I guess they call it a residency, at uh, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, which was a USC affiliate. That was, you know, I always have loved the genetics. And uh, this was a way to do genetics without being a pediatrician. So all it's all good. Um, but the the other people who were fellows at the same time as me were pediatricians, and so we'd go to clinic. They would they the nurses would sort of try to steer the older patients to me. <laughs> somebody wanted to birth control, she came to worry. <laughs> but you know, somebody would come in and you're supposed to give them medication for the baby's um, uh, ear infection. This was before I had kids of my own. I had no clue, and they just laugh at me. And then one day somebody else had a patient who wanted her birth control pills renewed. And they said, and, and the and the other doctor came in and said, and they, she doesn't know what kind she's on. And I said, well, are they green? Are they white? Are they pink? Are they yellow? Do they come in a long thin package or a round package? This is what we did all the time when I was a resident, you know? So they all looked at me like, oh, she's not brain damaged. She just has a different skill set. <laughs> so that was my, but um, after I finished at uh, my genetics fellowship, um, I came back to USC because I still had a staff appointment at USC. And things got kind of ugly because my mentor, who's a guy named Larry Platt, wanted to start a, um, a prenatal genetics div division, but his boss, with whom he was butting heads all the time, said, well, Marie's the one who's trained. Maybe Marie should be the head of this. And I was like, I'm not getting between those two. <laughs> <laughs> and about this point, yeah, UCLA came in, in to recruit me. So I went over to UCLA. Marie, That's before kind of, we I'm, go back, before we go back and establish some personal history, just an overt political yeah, question right now. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, what is your perspective on, you know, where we are as a society right now and how this could have happened? You know, um, my perspective is that I think a lot of the people are thinking about this in very simplistic ways. It's like, okay, it's a bad thing to kill a fetus. So therefore we should make that illegal. Yeah. I've done a number of terminations. Uh, 
many of them later ones because I get the genetic disease ones. And what do you do with a fetus that has, I had a fetus that had no, nothing recognizable above the upper lip. You know, there's a blob, maybe there was some brain tissue in there, but there were no eyes, no nose. This is never going to be a person. And you know, the story with this lady was that she was from Arizona. Her doctor had scanned her when she was 16 weeks. I mean, let me, um, at that time, roughly the, 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 um, limit for termination many places was about 24 weeks. Um, so anyway, so she, uh, her doctor scans her at 16 weeks, goes, ah, refers her to the maternal fetal guy because the doctor is not really supposed to be calling this kind of stuff. The maternal fetal appointment takes a little while to um, to happen, and then the maternal fetal guy scans her and says ah, and sends back immediately a note to the doctor saying this is terrible, you know, this is not a, a survivable um, condition. So the doctor that day filled out the forms, talked to the patient she wanted to terminate, filled out the forms to the insurance company to get this authorized. At the insurance company, somehow the forms just got put aside. I don't know this whether this was somebody who didn't want to to uh, uh, approve an abortion or whether it was just somebody who lost track of what was going on or what but um at the point where this finally came around the um the the you know the lady went in to look for a termination and they said well you're more than 24 weeks we can't do it so um because that was the law in arizona so the law in California says that if the doctor can make a good faith determination that the fetus is not going to survive, is not viable, but it doesn't mean not alive now, not be not going to be able to survive after delivery, that you can do the termination anytime it comes up. So they wanted to refer her, they re wound up referring her over to us at Harbor because no private doc wanted to get their hands in this. And um you know, you could say, well, she's already like 26 weeks. What difference does it make? Just let her go to term and deliver. But I sat down and talked to this lady and she said, I don't go out anymore. Because when you're pregnant, I, by that time, had kids. People come up to you and the, strangers come up to you on the street and pat, pat you in the stomach and say, oh, is it a boy or a girl? Have you chosen a name yet? And you've got a monster inside, you know. And one that you know is not going to survive. It's just she was not able to deal with this anymore. So we, she came in and we arranged for her termination, um, not because I hated this baby, but just because she needed help. Um, you know, I, I've and I have a whole list of of. Um, you know, babies who were just horribly gone wrong, um, pregnant women who were, you know, 14 years old. I don't know if that counts as a woman, but anyway. Um, you know, it's just, these are not simple decisions. And just saying, we're gonna draw a line and say 15 weeks beyond that, you can't do anything, is not, is not realistic. You know, it, it, it um, there are plenty of people especially a few years ago when they've got infertility treatments, would get pregnant with four or five babies. And the chances of it being pregnant with four or five of actually getting healthy kids out of this is pretty small. So there are people who will, I've not done this myself, but there are people who will go in and basically abort some of these kids, basically stop the heart of a few of the, the fetuses so that the others have a better chance at survival. It's not because mom doesn't want to have kids. It's just because the chances of going to even close to term with five is, is minuscule. And uh, um, that's, again, it's hard to sort of, how do you, how do you process that in the light of all this other stuff? And don't tell me that God will provide. That's what people always tell me when they don't want to believe that there's something wrong with the baby. And I've had women after the baby before look at me and say, why didn't you tell me it was so bad? And you're like, <laughs> so, um, 
but the other thing is I, as I've gotten older, I realized that, you know, doing ultrasound is a lot of it is just like being the person at Sears who takes baby pictures. You know, it's, it's just, it's patient, it's patient entertainment and you look at a few things, but the chance of you know, an unselected uh, baby that you're going to find something serious is very small, but that's fun. And then every once in a while there's a problem and I don't wish for anybody to have a problem, but when there is one, it's like the most interesting puzzle in the world, trying to figure out what it is and where it is and what else goes along with, might go along with that. And excuse me. And that's what kind of keeps me doing this. And that's not science in any real, real sense, but it, that is kind of how I, how I got here. Um, but as far as, as pregnancy terminations, it's like, there's two sides to that coin, and I don't know, you know, how how much you favor one over the other. It's regressive, though. At the end, yeah, of the day. yeah, I, I'm I I am quite sure that it's regressive. There are a certain number of people, or at least used to be a certain number of people, who were using abortion as their means of birth control, and in this country, at least, that's um, unfortunate because we have better, safer, and better ways to do this. Um, but most people who are getting a termination are not getting a termination because they had a fight with their boyfriend. They're getting a termination because something terrible is going on. Yeah. Um, and that's not going to go away by being forcing them to bring the baby to term. No, no. I mean, even the ones that are, that are years and years ago, I had a lady who I didn't, she was not really my patient, but I, um, met her in a clinic that I was working in and looking at her chart she was you know what skin popping is no it's just injecting cocaine I think it was cocaine but just right under the skin not into a vessel and she, and she was skin popping in her breasts and I'm pretty sure because she had multiple abortions and I'm pretty sure that part of the reason was that um, the skin popping is better during pregnancy because the breasts get more vascular. So, and then she'd go to about 12 weeks and then she'd have an abortion. And I mean, really disgusting reason to get pregnant and have an abortion. On the other hand, you're going to punish her by making her have a baby. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, there's no good right answer to this. Sure. Sure. Oof. Well, Mary, let's, Mary, let's go back in uh, happier times. Let's, let's go back okay, to high okay. school. Um, did you grow up in the Los Angeles area? Mm -hmm. I did. I went to uh, high school in Palos Verdes um, High School, which is public school. But, and did your um, father involve you in his career? Did you have an idea of what academic medicine looked like? You know, I knew what the lab looked like. We'd all been to the lab from when I was a little kid. We used to go down there on the weekends with him sometimes and you know, when you're a little kid, the most exciting things were the the chairs on wheels and the the you know the that that stuff that they put over the top of test tubes that you can stretch out more and more. We, you know, the contest was to see how much you could stretch it out. But we all knew what a lab looked like. Um, I didn't know about academic medicine in the sense of you know the the kind of peculiar things that go with academics anyway. The the but just like you don't know how a big company really works until you go work for one. Um, but yeah, I grew up in LA uh, or West LA and then down in, in Palos Verdes. My, uh, we had the, had the advantage that my father took a sabbatical when I was about 13 and we lived for a year in London, which was an amazing experience. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But when it came time for me to go to college, um, I was applying for various places and I wanted to apply to Stanford. And my brother, who's a year and a half younger than I am, pitched a fit because he wanted to go to Stanford and he didn't want, you know, that was his school. He didn't want me to take it. Mind you, neither one of us went to Stanford. <laughs> But um, so it was sort of like, okay, what other good place in California? And I got a letter from Caltech saying, by the way, you know, we're now accepting women. 
I, I got in recruiting letters from crazy places. I got several from Michigan State to which my father said, oh, fullback or, or, <laughs> or halfback. But, but um, um, so I got interested in Caltech and then I applied, but it was sort of like one of, you know, 20 applications you sent out. And my dad went to a meeting that he went to every year that was in a similar. And it must have been an immunology meeting. I don't even really remember what that meeting was about. But he met Ray Owen, who I think he'd met before. And Ray Owen walks up to him and says, your daughter's applying to Caltech. And he says, uh, yeah. <laughs> First time my dad was ever approached by a scientist to say, oh, we're interested in your kid. Um, and, uh, and Ray said, uh, send her out to see me. So I went out to take the tour at Caltech and he talked to me for a while and he arranged for one of his students to take me around and show me show me the, the place. And that was kind of, you know, as compared to, I went to UC Santa Cruz and I attended a lecture of some guy talking about how to build a compost heap which just struck me as maybe, you know, kind of far from what I was really interested in. And uh, uh, trying to remember where else I actually got to interview. You know, you didn't travel as much in those days as, as you do now. So, because um, our, our kids were all like, oh, we're going as far away as possible. They all wanted to go out to places in the East Coast. We did the great, for both of them, the great college tour everywhere. Um, but uh, uh, so I just said, okay, yeah, I'll go to Caltech. It'll, it'll be fun. And uh, and then you got there, and after you know a couple of months, you realized I didn't know there were so many people in the world like me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and that was actually true of my younger daughter went to art school, and she had the same reaction after a while. She was like, you know, wait. There are all these people. They think the same things are important. They think, you know? <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of when I decided that that was really in the right place. There, there were always a few people. There was one guy who, in my freshman class who left to go to Stanford because he wasn't popular enough with the girls at Caltech. It was, you know, it was he. He thought of himself as a real catch, and everybody else was like, "Yeah, right." <laughs> And Marie, so, growing up, were you always more on the science and math side? Was that where your academic strengths and interests were? Oh, yeah. Um, you were talking about high school guidance counselors? Yeah. In those days, and I don't think my high school was so far out of the mainstream, you know, the high school guidance counselor got, you know, call, you know they call you all in when you're getting ready to apply to colleges. And he says, you have really good grades. You should apply to USC. And I was like, I'm a UCLA faculty brat, and I'm like, <laughs> so, um, but I, at the end of the senior year, you know, they give out prizes for various pieces of nonsense. I got the math prize. I was the first girl who had ever gotten the math prize at PV High. You know, it was just girls got the English prize, boys got the math prize. It was not, I'm not sure that that was exactly that way but but it seemed like it and uh, the reason i got the math prize was because well i don't do you want it? this is a long story please 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 um when i was we went to we went and spent a year in london so when i came back from london i started i was a freshman in high school and they put me in algebra class because that was what they thought where they thought I my math needed to go and it was like the slowest class you ever were in I was just like going crazy so I went after a couple of weeks I went to the to the guidance counselor and I said this is crazy can I get into a better math yes you know, a smarter kid math class and they looked at me funny and they said well all of the smart kids took algebra in the last school in middle school and that's not where you are so so um i they finally made a deal with me that okay here here's the book study it on your own 
let us know how you do. And I was, you know, new in town. I didn't have very many friends and I was a little ticked off. So I took out a calendar and I listed the number of pages I had to do every, every um, uh, week. And halfway through the school year, I came up and I said, I'm done now. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and they said, uh, okay, the next class is geometry. Here's a geometry book, go. So I did, I, by that time I had some friends, so I only did half of the geometry book. And then, um, so I said, okay, well, what am I going to do? Well, the way they did summer school was clearly not to get for you to get ahead because they did first half of geometry in the morning and second half of geometry in the afternoon. So it was only for kids who had, it was, it was intended for kids who had flunked one half of geometry or the other. But, um, but this was great for me because I took second half of geometry in summer school and they handed around these cards and, and uh, this teacher said, I want you to write on the card what you got in your first uh, semester of geometry and what you got in your second half, second semester. And we took the cards up and I said, I didn't have a second semester grade. She says, oh, you're the one. So, so that was my, I, cause in those days, not every, everybody took algebra to get who was intending to go to college. Um, so, or not, I uh, sorry, calculus. So I never got to calculus. The guys who had done calculus were really ticked off about me getting the, the math prize. <laughs> the math was, Math was never hard, you know. Was, I have I have to say though, I have a, a, a bone to pick with the calculus people. The number of people who use calculus in their daily lives is, you know, some engineers, physicists maybe. Um, and they don't require statistics. And you, you look at the newspaper articles and they say the most idiotic things about statistics. And nobody challenges it because nobody understands what they're talking about. And it just seems to me like you know, what regular people need is not calculus. They need statistics. But there you go. Now, were you aware, even as a, as a high school junior, that Caltech had admitted women? Did that register with you at all? I don't think so. It was a time when a lot of schools were admitting women for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, a friend of mine, his older sister was one of the first women at Yale. And so you knew that that, that kind of stuff was being possible. I'm not sure I even knew about Caltech very well. Um, and, and it just sort of, you know, it, story of my life, I just sort of fell into it really more than anything else. Now, when you got there, did it feel... I mean, obviously you would have had nothing to compare it to, but the year before, this was brand new. Did it mm -hmm. feel like the adjustment had been made at that point, that Caltech was a place that had women and things felt normal? No. Um, I lived in um, one of the, Ruddick House. It's got some other name now, but um, I, and actually Debbie Deason was or she's now Debbie Hall, but she was Debbie Deason at the time, was sort of the den mother of, there were six women in this house with about 90 guys. Um, I remember there, so somebody had decided to make a women's nook by hanging curtains in the hallway so that our rooms were separated. This never worked. Um, you know, the stupid curtains were, were a bad idea. There was one women's room, which would act, was act, obviously made just by somebody put, writing W-O before the men, because it still had urinals in it. Uh -huh. um, it took us about half a year to figure out why it always smelled so terrible in there. And it's because the nobody ever flushed the urinals, because why would we? You know, we used them to hang up our bathing suits that were wet after a swim. But, you know, and, and we've we discovered that we had to go in about once a week and flush the urinals and this and terrible smell went away. But um, there was a lot of, excuse me. I don't know if, if, if you've heard these stories, but there were a lot of, there was a sort of a tradition about grabbing people and throwing them into a shower in their clothes. Um, 
or if they were really obnoxious, carrying them all the way down and throwing them in the, one of the ponds. Um, and, you know, there are now girls and there are a lot of guys who are not sure how they can get to touch a girl. And so girls tend to get, have that happen to them maybe more than others. I, I don't think I ever really felt like I got felt up or any of that, but it just sort of, um, but uh, um, yeah, it, it was, there were some ways that you really felt like you fit in better than, than you had in, in high school. And other ways you'd sort of get pulled up short and realize that, okay, yeah, this is still weird. Um, one time Debbie and her roommate, Marion, just, we just decided to have a slumber party. There were all of six of us, you know, and you would have thought there was nothing else going on in the universe, except that a bunch of girls are sitting in this one room gossiping. And the guys were like sitting outside the door with, you know, glasses up to the door, shotgun mics got through the window. And it's like, we are not talking about you. <laughs> But it was just, it was really funny because they, they, a lot of these guys were not very well socialized. There were, you know, it was typically during the day and the evening when you were doing homework and stuff, your door would be open. And we had guys who would come in and sit in our room. And then when you decided to go to bed, wouldn't leave. And you just to finally kind of roll your eyes and go to bed and let him sit there in the dark. And, and, uh, um, but these were the ones who were, who were never going to be very well, well socialized. They were just, you know, the guys who got A's in computer science and D's and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Actually not, it was not computer science. I don't think there were that many computer science nerds in those days, but, but, um, yeah, they were only interested in one thing and that was, that was all that was all that really mattered. Marie, was it always life sciences for you that you were most interested in? Um yeah, I I was I had no experience in physics. It was another thing that I got it was really funny. Um you were supposedly physics got the high school physics and calculus were supposed to be prerequisites for getting into Caltech. As it turned out, I had neither. For some reason, the whole math thing just kind of went right by me. But um, physics, I knew I was in trouble. So I sat down with the high school physics book and went through that over the summer before college. And it turned out that made absolutely no difference whatsoever because high school physics is taught with really no math at all. And the problem was when the professor came in the first day and wrote a differential equation on the board and I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> The, only, the thing that saved me the first year was that it was all pass fail and I managed to squeak out passes. I would not have gotten very good grades a lot of that first year, but um, um, by the beginning of the second year, I had kind of caught up and, and uh, it was, it was that sort of Caltech thing where the, the really smart guys had done math too, you know, and, and it's like, listen, I was lucky to get past math one. You know? Guilty with an excuse, um, but that was that was kind of the way it worked. Um, was there intelligence shared among the women undergraduate, particularly with the older class, about you know professors who were considered allies to a degree? You know, I don't, I don't remember very much talk about professors. Um, there were certain there were certain grad students that you kind of knew you wanted to avoid um but um the thing i remember was when i was a sophomore or junior i've forgotten we had we had women we had a, a new set of freshmen and there were still you know like 15 guys for every girl um and some guy was trailing around after this girl and we said, you know, you don't have to take this. You can just tell him to go away. The other guys will make him go away if you tell them that he's bothering you. And they just couldn't imagine, you know, turning down a guy and you're like, you'll learn. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, the, one of the most fun things about Caltech was that being interested in math, being interested in physics, 
was not a turnoff for a lot of the guys. It was like, finally, somebody I could talk to. Because <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in high school, you constantly had to kind of censor yourself so that you didn't sound like you were too studious or too, you know. Um, but but Caltech, for a lot of the guys, at least, it was not that way. It was It was like, this is the only thing I really know anything about. Go. <laughs> So, um, um, you know, the other thing I remember about um, first year at Caltech, I took the regular English class, which was some kind, I don't know, some kind of survey, and but the a lot of it was books about young men coming of age, which I think had been picked out in a previous iteration of Caltech. And we, um, one day we were tasked to read a portrait of the artist as a young man, which I read cover to cover and hated it. <laughs> and it was because here's a guy whose constant plaint is that women are mysterious and unknowable and are jerking him around and, you know, won't get, you know, aren't interested in him. And it was just, he was such a weenie. And and so we all go in there to, the first thing we're supposed to discuss the book. And unknown to me, the uh, professor was a Joyce scholar. And um, the the first day we go in there and, and, uh, and he said, well, what did everybody think? And I said, I think Stephen Dedalus is a toad. <laughs> Which was... Of, of the many things that he thought might come up, that was not one of them. <laughs> and, and he kind of, uh, 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 and he said, yeah, class dismissed. So all of my classmates were like, yay, do that next time. <laughs> but it wasn't that I, you know, I you know I had read the damn book, but the problem was it was just not speaking to me at all. And I think they finally caught it got that idea, but it was for a while, it was sort of like every book you were reading was about somebody else. Yeah. Somebody who specifically had trouble with you and you're like, I don't like you, you know. <laughs> so um that but that was sort of my experience of, of it it was a lot of just getting people to put bathrooms in and and um you know not you know, sort of not teach to the, you know, 20 year old male paradigm that they had in their heads. And, and uh, um, now when I started medical school, it, sorry, this is not a Caltech issue, but um, there were twice as many people, much, twice as many women as my med in my medical school classes had ever been in any uh, UCLA class before. And it used to be at least but from what you read, fairly common in all kinds of medical schools for the professors to slip pinup pictures into their slide set. Mm -hmm. That happened once. And there was such an outcry that it never happened again. But it was there was finally enough women in the class that um you know that there was sort of that critical mass. People weren't going to take this kind of bullshit anymore. Um and of course, my experience at medical school was like, I haven't seen so many women around in a long time. <laughs> but that was not everybody's experience. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm kind of like flitting around here. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. Marie, what about politically on campus? Of course, Caltech is a very different place than Berkeley or Columbia, but the women's rights movement, civil rights, the Vietnam War, were these issues that you remember as an undergraduate? Um, I remember the Vietnam War. Um, one thing was, it always seemed like the professors were more politically aware than the students were, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I think is, and, and more liberal than the, some of the students were, which was not necessarily the way things worked other places. But there was a, um, a big, poster that went up on the side of the library um, that said impeach Nixon. And uh, 
I think I know some of the guys who had had to do with putting that up. But, but so there were people that, oh, I remember working in the lab and it was during the Nixon, um, the whole Watergate thing. And they had this whole series. There's, there's the White House, uh, Creep, others. And they had all of these names of people and arrows uh, who, who'd implicated who and what. <laughs> and, and the blackboard in the lab. So it was, there was a lot of sort of quiet glee about all this stuff going on to politicians. I'm not sure it wouldn't have been similar if it had been more liberal politicians, but you know, um, that was, but that was kind of the, the, the limit of it. As I recall, there, there were, the other thing was that my class was the last one to get draft numbers. Um, the, I, do you know about this? Or, yeah. Or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as it turned out, nobody from my eight, my class was actually drafted. I don't think, but, but they, they were the last ones to actually get the numbers to show what, what order you were in. Mm -hmm. um, they were very smart about this. They would say, we, we don't plan on taking um, more than up to number 60. And then once they distributed the numbers, everybody who's had a number higher than 60 would lose interest in it, <laughs> all this stuff. And uh, so, but yeah, it was, it was, Vietnam was there. It was all the time. It was, you all knew people who'd been drafted. You knew people who'd done semi weird things to avoid getting drafted. Um, and, and so it was, and it just didn't seem like it was like the war in Afghanistan became, it didn't seem like we were accomplishing anything other than burning money and people, you know, um, but I don't remember there being a lot of a lot of um, verbiage about either women's rights or civil rights. Um, trying to think if I knew more than one black guy at Caltech, and I'm not sure that I did. Um, Uh, two. There was there was one guy who was um, famous for being clumsy in the in the chemistry lab, and all I really know about him was that every time you hear a crash of glass, he'd, he'd say, "It's just me. I'm fine." <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not even sure it was always him, but you know. <laughs> but um, it was sort of like somebody away over there you couldn't really see. So so, uh, um, and that was organic lab, the, the freshman chem labs when I was a freshman were farmed out because the uh, gates, the chemistry building had was um, closed because of the earthquake. And so we were, there were like three or four of us in somebody's chemistry lab where they kind of kept us corralled over in a certain spot so we couldn't wreck anything real. <laughs> um, yeah. Marie, were there any uh, faculty members who were really useful to you as either mentors or in focusing your academic interests? You know, um, probably the two that were the most um, useful to me in, ac in an academic sense were um, uh, Bill Wood and Lee Hood. Um, I worked in Bill Wood's lab for a while um also he um it's not that i ever talked to him about this but he had a famous father so sort of the same kind of thing that you know you, you how what do you do about about all this stuff? lee hood was the two of them were writing the biochemistry textbook and the first year i took biochemistry what we had was sort of like copied pages or preprints or something of the book. And so we would mark it up and say, eh. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, they were people that I, I was around a lot. I worked with, um, admired. Um, Max Delbrook was um, a very senior professor who, um, uh, he was famous in the biology department that he would have parties. And it was a great thing to be invited to Max Delbrook's house for a party because 
for one thing, it's the only place I have ever actually had my hands on a Nobel Prize because he would get them out. <laughs> and the other thing is that crazy things would happen. Like one time, um, his daughter, I think he had much younger children. He was an older guy, but um, they had a puppet theater left over from some children's birthday party. And so he said, we're going to put on a, 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 a a play, a puppet play. I have no idea how much of this was a put on by Max or what, because they got this whole thing. And then there's a, an evil professor who's going to give the students a, a question that can't be answered and then fail them all, you know. And then there's some, I, there's some servant or, or chef or something who, who thinks to the, to the students. So um, the uh, what was it? Neuroanatomy, I think. There was a there was a advanced biology class that I hadn't taken yet because I was a junior student. But they had a couple of the students playing the students, and uh, uh, they had the neuroanatomy professor playing something. Like the professor, I think, but I'm not sure. And uh, they 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 get to the crucial point of the show, and. And the the, the uh, servant explains to the students what's going on, and one of the students says, oh, "That's even worse than neuroanatomy." <laughs> At which point, the the the, the, uh, the uh, performance was called because the professor couldn't go on. <laughs> and I, I, that may have been a put up from the students and Max to to sort of let this professor know that things were a little bit too intense in his class. <laughs> he was a, I think he was the, his first year teaching, but, um, but that was the kind of, we used to, um, um, Reddick House was known as being the house that had the most Glee Club members. And so when we went out Christmas caroling, it was a big deal. And um, we would arrange our Christmas caroling um, uh, uh, route so that we wound up at Max's because if you told him when you were coming, he'd invite everybody in. <laughs> so he was, he was fun. He was not somebody that I ever worked with in a scientific sense, but he was extremely approachable. And if you got him going, he started talking about, well, he was a student in Heidelberg back in the old days when if you were really a, uh, you know, you, you, people would, would duel in, uh, to get interesting looking scars that impressed the girls. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure how much of that was really true. I, I'm, I'm sure that at some point that was true in Heidelberg. <laughs> Marie, did you stay on campus during the summers? Did you do lab work or you went back home? Um, I did do lab work for at least two of the summers. I did not stay on campus. I, at those, at, at, at when I was there, the, the dorms weren't open in the summertime. Um, we stayed in this uh, house. I don't remember how we found it the first year. But there was this little house that was down Orange Grove or down uh, California all the way past Orange Grove um, that was uh, was a little old lady who liked to go for the summer and visit her relatives on the East Coast. And she was looking for girls because they were less destructive than boys. But it was the most amazing house. She had apparently been uh, married to a... a minister for a long time and he had died and so she was you know going around but it's this little tiny house under a leaning tree um and one day we were we had invited our professors over for dinner and we were looking around in the kitchen for s serving dishes and things like that, that for this and up on the upper shelf there's a violin case we were like, huh? And it was a Stradivarius. <laughs> the only reason I know that's what it was is because there's a newspaper clipping in about it in, in the in the violin case. So we were like, we're putting this away and forgetting we ever saw it. You know? <laughs> but it was that kind of place. You you stumbled over, you know, big silver tea, tea services when you started looking around for things. So, but it was a lot of fun. And it was... Uh, four of us, two bedrooms, so two of us. And the first year it was me and Francis Jansen and then a woman who was a, a grad student 
And another woman who was not a Caltecher but had been on the Caltech uh, cheerleader squad. So um, it's sort of a different different version of life. The, we had to have the grad or the grad student was very important because we had the use of this lady's car, but only but he had to be a certain age to fall in. He had to be more than twenty five, I think, to get her to to fall under her insurance. So only the grad student did. And the, the, it was this enormous Cadillac, and the grad student was a little woman, and she'd sit there like this trying to drive because she could barely see out out the uh, windshield. But we used to use it like once a week to go down for for um, uh, gr grocery shopping. And we tended to take about three other people as well because they were like, "Hey, transportation to the grocery store, yeah, I'll do that." So, so we have a have a big event once a week and drive the car and, and go down to the grocery store. But I haven't thought about that place in a long time. <laughs> When, when did you settle on medical school for your next move? And were there any professors who were encouraging you to think, you know, not medical school, but a PhD in biology? Well, like I said, um, uh, Lee Hood used to say, don't go to medical school to everybody. Um, but I don't remember... I don't remember anybody saying to me, yeah, yeah, go to medical school. It was, that was my dad. Um, I think it was more just second year biochemistry. The one of the finals or the, one of the things at the end, the end was you had to submit a research proposal and the, um, the grades were accepted, accepted, but not funded and not accepted. <laughs> so, and part of this, I'm not sure quite what all of their thinking was with this, but it sort of, it, it, it made you understand that just having a good idea was not going to get it, you know, that, that, and I wasn't quite ready to go out there and start tooth and nailing it, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to, to be getting money. And you realized when you started looking around at PhD programs, they weren't asking you to come in and have a great idea. They were asking you to come in and work on their idea. And so it wasn't really as exciting as it would have been to be going out there and curing the, curing the world. Um, is, this is one of those things that you learn as you get older, is, especially in academics. People, students are all the time coming in and saying, I want to, I want to study this disease. And you look at them and you say, well, it's about 13 people in Los Angeles who have that disease. It's just, is there, in, in any kind of reasonable time frame, there is no way that we're going to be able to get anything done. You know, that we have to either look at a uh, something that looks like that disease, or we have to, um, we have to think of another, another topic. And that's a big part of the problem with any scientific endeavor is the stuff, you know, people wind up doing weird things with, with toad eggs. And it's not because anybody really cares about toad eggs. It's because you're sitting there trying to figure out how you get to the question you really want to answer um, in a way that you can actually do. So, but when you're when you're the student applying for for you know, the next level of of, um, of studies, toad eggs just just does not sound like the great <laughs> the greatest thing in the world. So, um, that's. And did you want to stay local? Was it Los Angeles that you were specifically focused on for for medical school? No, that was that was happenstance. Um, I got I actually got accepted at other places, but not any place any better than UCLA. And and I had a certain amount of pressure from home that yeah yeah UCLA is a good place. So okay, um, I did my my residency in New York, so um, about as far far away as it was really possible to get. You have to go. You have to leave leave home sometime, you know. <laughs> so, um, but I got married my third year of medical school, about the the end of my third year. My husband had all had finished law school, which is only three years, 
and he'd accepted a job in New York. So I was only applying for training in New York. Um, so, but as a student, I arranged to do some rotations at hospitals in New York, um, which is actually one of the things you do anyway when you're, when you're looking for internships is to try to impress them with how great you are. But the, the funny part about this was that um, I went for a month and then I came back and I was staying with my parents because why should we have another, another uh, apartment in LA? And uh, my mother said her friends came up to her and said, did something happen? <laughs> we used to say we knew lots of people who lived together before they got married, but we were the only people that we knew who didn't live together after they got married. Because <laughs> that first year I was sort of back and forth, um, which really, to me, the hardest part about marriage was always what I called roommate issues. You know, um, what do you do with the wet towels? Um, how do you, you know, my husband always put his uh, wire hangers in with the clothes in the laundry basket, which drove me crazy. Um, and since we would be together for a month and then not together for a month and then back together for a month, we went through all those roommate issues about four times <laughs> before we finally sort of settled on, on a consistent thing. But we're still married, so I guess it's not that bad. <laughs> And he's he's also a Caltech grad, so we're like the the atypical Caltech grads. He was a law school professor. Oh wow! So, um, it's really funny because he's he's never practiced law. Now, law schools are a little different. They don't strongly encourage the faculty to go out there and you know, do trials or whatever. But um, he lives to write. You know, and one of the nice things about the law is that, excuse me, um, although he may take a data set and do some statistics on it, he doesn't go out there and generate new new numbers on anything. He's, he, you know, it's, it's a lot of it is opinion. Um, and you know what the story is with lawyers is that they'll argue about anything. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, but he's still he he's been retired from any full-time um, faculty position for 10 years and he still he still puts out a couple of papers a year he's got an emeritus position and that's that's good enough for the law reviews so whatever but he he does it because he loves it yeah it's not not what i would choose choose to spend my time on if i didn't have any you know but nobody really cares what i want to write so <laughs> Marie, coming in with a Caltech degree, how well prepared were you for, for medical school, at least in the classroom? The thing that was hardest about medical school was all the memorization, because Caltech was totally not about memorization. Mm -hmm. And in, um, in medicine, you know, it was there was one time where we were supposed to, they expected that we would have memorized all the steps in the Krebs cycle, um, which I can't even tell you. But I was like, really? Come on, everybody can look that up. <laughs> uh, there's also, um, but once you get out on the boards, there, there's the expectation that you're going to know if they tell you somebody's potassium is six, is that normal or not? And you know anything that you do, you know, several times a day, you you start to learn. But it still strikes me as like, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just have the report in front of you and it says what's normal? Because every once in a while they change the reagents or something, and the normal becomes different anyway. Um, but that's that that was always in medicine. That was always a big a big deal was that you were supposed to be able to know what thing know what know what was normal. Um, The other, the other thing is that in medicine, more than most of the scientific stuff that I that I learned, there is just so much that we don't really know. It's like this whole COVID response where everybody is like, ah, oh, they were lying to us. They were, uh, they didn't, they just didn't know. You know, that's that's what medicine is like. 
is it the right thing to do a cardiac bypass on somebody? Who the heck knows, you know? Um, a lot of times they say, they say about surgeons that if your only tool is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Mm -hmm. And surgeons will operate on things just because they can. And you have to catch up with them afterwards and say, no, that really isn't the best thing to do about that. Um, so it's, and nobody's, you know, you can't do a really good controlled trial. There's too many um, unknown, you know, there's too many variables. You just have to do the best you can. And uh, um, medicine slowly, slowly has gotten into this, the ideal is what they call evidence-based medicine that you're supposed to be looking at what the the studies tell you. Unfortunately, anything that's more than about 15 years old is based on on standards of, of study that we wouldn't accept nowadays. So it's you still sort of going around and around. Um, when I was a um, medical student, I had this very bad habit of spending more time writing down the jokes than um, the actual stuff that they were saying in the lecture. And there was a, a professor, a guest professor who, I think he claimed that this was a, um, a, a response that he heard from a professor, but anyway, somebody asked him what he thought was an impertinent question. And he said, young man, there are so many things in medicine for which there is no good explanation that you might as well just stop thinking and start memorizing right now. <laughs> and my husband keeps saying, well, that's not logical. And it's like, it doesn't have to be logical. <laughs> It's logical according to some system that we haven't figured out yet. You know, it's so. It's like, why, why, why do I keep testing? He tested positive for COVID a couple of weeks ago. Why do I keep testing positive? Well, because there's stuff lingering around. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why isn't it? Why don't? Why are, am I not still infectious? It's like it's not a why question. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you have to have a lot more tolerance for uncertainty. <laughs> Marie, when did you develop the interest in obstetrics? Was that before your residency? Oh, yeah. Well, you you sort of have to decide what you want to do your residency in. And it's really funny that the, you finish the second year of medical school, you get into the clinical clerkships. And that means you go out on the wards, basically. And at the beginning of that time, there's a few people who have ideas about what they want to do. And a lot of people are just kind of like, mm. um, and then a lot of people, you do the, you do your first rotation in surgery and a lot of people get done with that. And they're like, well, that's not something I'm never doing again. And, and eventually most of us got to something where you're like, yeah, that's it. That's what I want to do. Some people are, yeah, I want to become a professor and the best way to do that is to do medicine and then do a, clerk, a, a fellowship in this or that. And then there are those who get to the end of the, the, the third year of medical school and say, I hated everything. And so then you have to think about why did you hate it? Um, I didn't like the, uh, the hierarchical structure. Well, that's really not going to be there when you, when you're in practice. Um, I don't like you know dealing with people. Okay, pathology that would be a good one for you. You know, or, or anesthesiology. Have you ever read heard of a book called The House of God? No. There is a book called The House of God. The House of God being the translation of Beth Israel, and it's about one of the big uh, Harvard hospitals in Boston, and it's about somebody's internship at the House of God. Um. And all kinds of, it, it's, it's when you've done an internship, I was an intern at Columbia, which is a very similar kind of setting. It's sort of painfully real, you know, the, the, they have all these aphorisms, the, the, some of them are things like H plus BUN equals Lasix dose, which is only funny if you're a doctor, <laughs> but then there, there are things like, um, uh, gummers go to ground, which means just that, that, um, 
uh, you know, people who are not old and useless, but old and non-functional. And why are we working so hard to keep this person alive when they don't value life and, and can't contribute to it? Um, go to ground means they fall down if you're not watching them. So, um, but then at some point somebody commits suicide and it's, it's, but one of the things is they sit down and his, um, his mentor is the senior resident who, who he calls the fat man. It turns out most of these apparently are real people. The fat man was rumored to be a gastroenterologist in Beverly Hills now. And, uh, uh, and he always used to say he's going to go into gastroenterology and do the bowel run of the stars. But um, so they sit down and say, well, if you don't want to deal with gomers, how can you not deal with gomers? Um, you can be, become a pathologist. You can become an anesthesiologist because they're all asleep anyway. You don't have to talk to them. Um, and then they say you can become a psychiatrist. Those of us, this is because the guy who wrote the book is a psychiatrist. Um, those of us who aren't psychiatrists says, oh, no, biggest gomers in the world. <laughs> Crazy people. Oh, no. Um, so it it. It, part of it is that the the patients that are involved in the specialty that you want are not annoying. Patients who have things that you don't think are interesting or you don't know what to do with tend to be more annoying. And people you can't cure tend to be more annoying. And so that's, that's kind of what the whole house of God thing is. Um, and like I said, it's, it's, borderline horrifying for anybody who's not in medicine, but it's really a lot closer to the truth than is really comfortable. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, when I was in training, I used to know people who claimed that they knew these people or some of them. So that was, that was, it had to have been written. I started my residency in 79. It was probably written in the early seventies. Marie, what was it like managing the two-body problem when you were choosing a residency program? Well, again, I, he already had a job in New York, mm -hmm. and there are lots of training programs in New York, so I just basically kind of confined my search to training programs in New York, and um, I guess I applied to Yale, uh, which is not too far from New York. Um, the funny part about that was you go to every, um, you know how dyed in little New Yorkers are like nothing exists west of the Hudson. So you go to the, uh, the they'd have these group interviews and there'd be like 10 people there and there would be me. There would be one person from, you know, Harvard, Yale, Brown, something, someplace like that. And then the other eight would be from New York medical college, which is not a especially high regard, highly regarded medical school and is also full of dyed in the wool New Yorkers. So they can't imagine going to a place else. They're all sitting there going, <laughs> and the other two of us are like, eh, <laughs> them again. So um, I never, I didn't feel a lot of anxiety about not being able to get a place in New York. One of the funny things was that the chair of the department of OBGYN at UCLA, where I had been a student, um, had been at Columbia, apparently, um, a lot of this faculty there hated his guts, but it didn't matter because he was still a force in the world. And he wrote, even though I had met him like twice, he wrote me like about a two and a half page letter. And I know because everybody who interviewed me sat there and said, oh, you have a, a letter from J.G. Moore and would sit there and read the whole thing in front of me. <laughs> and I'm quite sure that's what got me my, my uh, uh, residency. But it was so funny because students have a tendency to say, well, the person who knows me the best is, uh, you know, that attending I really liked in pediatrics. And that's not who you want to get to write your letter. And the, the guys, the, 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 attend, uh, the, the department chairs know that, but I think the students, a lot of times they're not, at least when I was in training are not, nobody really sort of pushes that at, that at them. And, uh, um, you know, if that, attending in pediatrics is any good, he'll say, I would be happy to write you a letter, but you really need to get one from, <laughs> from somebody who makes a difference. <laughs> Marie, what kind of medicine did you want to practice as a result of the, of the residency? How did that uh, focus your options? I wanted to, 
well, I, you know, my um, image of medicine was always academic medicine. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, when I was, um, I was at Harbor, my dad was also at Harbor. Um, so we crossed paths in, you know, for, for sort of, uh, um, you know, like, like, uh, official banquets and that kind of stuff occasionally. So somebody I know, not a physician, was at a uh, an event and met my mother. This was at a time when I was the vice chair of the OB department. And this this my friend said to my mother, oh, you must be so proud of Marie. She's doing so well. And my mother said, well, she's not doing very much research. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's I am proud of a lot of the things I've done in medicine, but I always have this feeling that it wasn't really a successful career because I didn't do research and write, you know, earth shaking papers and stuff. Um, but that's what you get. I've enjoyed myself a lot of the time. Following residency, what came next? What, what were you considering? Well, again, um, most residencies don't really prepare you for an academic career. Mm -hmm because there is no research component in a residency. Most, most um, um, accredited fellowships will have a research component. So I, I, I always knew I was going to do a fellowship. I did my fellowship in maternal fetal medicine because that's what I liked. And um, did, some, did research and fellowship because of the place where I was a fellow, it was more um, um, what they call clinical research based on, on clinical data sets rather than than going to the lab and doing stuff. But um, And did you want to return to Los Angeles? Was that part of the calculation? Um, not I mean it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal. It was really more that that the premier fellowship positions were at USC, probably at Yale. Um, and those were the biggies in those days. Now, why USC? Why in that area? Do you know the history there? You know, it was just, again, it, part of it was just that they had so many deliveries. Uh -huh. And so, you know, of those, of those 13 people with that disease in, in, in LA, 10 of them were going to USC. So, <laughs> um, but uh, that was, that was really the, the, the biggest the biggest issue is that I knew people who could get me in there. I, um, you know, it was a, it was a well-regarded program. Most of the people in that field had spent some time at USC mm -hmm. in the, in those days. And, uh, so that just seemed like a, a good fit. And in those days, the, the residencies now are done according to what they call the match, which means that, um, the the candidates um, apply. They rank their programs from one to whatever. They can discard you know they can discard programs that they don't want to match with, and the the programs rank their candidates, and then it goes into a huge computer and mixes it all up. But so there's there's very little ability to sort of game the program. You can't get anybody to commit to you early um, because you don't have any way of enforcing that even if they say, oh, yes, yes, I'll, I'll work you first. They can tell 10 people that you can't tell the difference. Um, and so, but, but, and the fellowships now are done the same way. But when I was a fellow, I interviewed at USC and the guy offered me a job at the, at the end of the day. So, um, and since that was a place that it was at least in my top two, I said, okay, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> um, so that was, that was kind of how I, yeah, I, I also, I applied at San Francisco because they had a, a genetics, um, uh, MFM slash genetics um, track, but that wasn't available by the time I actually got for, got there for an interview and they were sort of like, well, we'll think about it. Yeah. And then the next day, the other guy offered me a job. I was like, yeah, I'm taking what I got. So. <laughs> 
Marie, being in that environment, was was it less clinical than it otherwise might have been? Were you spending more time in the laboratory, more time doing research? You know, um, there in those days, it was kind of back and forth all the time. Nowadays, uh, for that kind of fellowship, you would be required to spend uh, 50% of the time in research, which means no more than one clinic a week. So um, uh, there's a good deal more active active expectation of research. You have to produce a, um, a thesis by the end of your fellowship, which is part of getting board certified. Mm -hmm. That was true even when I was a fellow. And actually one of the more common reasons for not getting board certified is that somebody can't, can't come up with an adequate thesis. Um, either because they didn't do any research or because they don't know how to uh, defend the thesis that they've got, which means they didn't do as much of it as they thought they did. So it's almost I mean, like a PhD within a, a, an MD world. Yeah, I would say so. I've never done a PhD defense, but I have to think it, it would be, this is sort of like a baby PhD defense. They, they ask you things like, um, you know, uh, this, this, this paper that you cited, was that a, um, a clinical a randomized trial or was that just a, a cohort trial? How many patients were in it? I had kind of heard about this. And so I read all that stuff up before I went in for my, for my uh, boards and it was fine that I could imagine somebody getting completely messed up. But, uh, the boards are hard. The the um, to become board certified in OBGYN, both after the residency and then again after the fellowship, you have to take an oral exam, and oral exams on the face of them are just threatening, because you just feel like people are going to laugh at you if you say something stupid, and there are people who give the orals who um, don't necessarily laugh, but they will they will be very harsh, such that they sort of terrorize people. Um, but, uh, uh, some of that's more legend than true, but, but I've had at least one of them give me one of the board exams. <laughs> <laughs> so then you gave this patient 10 units of insulin, which you think is the right dose. <laughs> so, like, so nobody's, nobody's going to die from 10 units of insulin. <laughs> so, anyway. What did you but, focus on for your thesis? I did a study on um, uh, treatment of premature labor with as a comparison of a couple of different drugs. Um, nowadays, they would do this trial with a um, a, um, a placebo arm, but in in those days, our human subjects committee wouldn't allow us to put in a placebo arm because they thought that it was unethical not to treat this turns out that none of the drugs are good enough that you can actually um, separate them from water clearly so that it it, it makes sense to do a placebo arm. And, and I, that was a defect in the study, but it wasn't anything that we could, that we could cure. Um, one of the things that was interesting about it was that one of the drugs that was most commonly used, you got so many side effects that it was less effective because people couldn't tolerate the dose. Then. Marie, when you decided at, at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles to, to focus on medical genetics, you were talking about how, you know, this gets you close to, to, to the pediatricians. Were you following all of the advances to go back to Lee Hood in protein sequencing and DNA sequencing? Were these technologies that were becoming relevant in a clinical setting at that point? Um, really, no. DNA sequencing now, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that's the most exciting is that now you can take pregnant women, take their blood, get the baby's DNA out of their blood, and um, and then sequence it. We're not quite there yet, but but the technology to sequence the baby's DNA is there. They do that on amniocentesis where we know it's baby, and we'll get there with the uh, with the, the cell-free DNA in the mom. And um, 
with with the mom's blood, they can they can um, they can test for like Down syndrome for a whole extra chromosome, and it's not quite as good as doing the amniocentesis, but it's close, and much less discomfort and risk um, than sticking a needle into the mom's stomach. Um, but the 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 what they call a perinatal microarray, they can look for all. It, it's the trouble is is that it's like a snark hunt. You, you test for a whole bunch of things, and or you test for they're they're not quite down to gene level, so that they're looking at at larger segments. If they find something that's maybe helpful, if they don't find anything, but you still got a baby whose stomach is on the wrong side or something, you don't know what going on here you just did the best test you could you don't know a lot of of um this is a an ob version of of medical dumb science the the screening for down syndrome in pregnancy for a long time was a blood test where they looked at um analytes which is a bunch of different proteins and hormones and blah blah um they the way they did this was that they took a bunch of moms who were pregnant with normal babies and a bunch of moms who were pregnant with babies with Down syndrome and tested their bloods for everything they knew how to test for, basically, and found, you know, six things that were different. The problem is, is that there's no overarching theory about why this should be true. It's just, that's what they got. So it's kind of, it, like I said, stupid science. It's just, you know, it's like when I tell the, the mom that it's a boy, uh, it's, I just look between the legs, you know, with the ultrasound. It's not, it's not science. It's just observation. So um, the DNA stuff is more um, scientific in the sense that there's actually a theory behind what you're doing and everything, but it's taken us quite a while to get there. Marie, in the 1980s, at the height of the AIDS crisis, was this something that you got involved in with expectant mothers? Oh yeah. Um, in New York, AIDS hit New York about the time I started my residency. And um, it was not so prevalent in, in pregnant women because the majority of the people who had it were gay, were gay men. Um, but you kept, you know, as time went on, it became more common in um, drug, drug users in New York. It's funny because it's a, it's a cultural difference between the, the, the coasts in California people would bring their own syringe and needle and whatever they might use it over and over but it was for themselves and and they get their drug and they'd inject in New York they'd go to um what they call a shooting gallery and the guy would give you this the loaded up syringe you'd shoot yourself up and then he'd take back the syringe and use it on the next guy and so there was much more HIV going through the uh, the drug users in the East Coast than there was in, on the West, always. Um, but um, um, yeah, it was, for a while, it was crazy. I can remember one um, patient, we would not do this now, but somebody did an amniocentesis on a uh, pregnant woman who we knew was HIV positive, and the lab refused to receive the specimen which is, would have been nice if we'd known about that beforehand, but, but it was just, everybody was terrified and didn't know how this was coming or where, you know, why, or, um, you know, what, what you needed to do to protect yourself. And so it was just, it was just crazy. Um, but, and I always thought the village voice wasn't doing, this was in New York, wasn't doing anybody any favors by saying that this was uniquely, they, they actually put out an editorial, this is uniquely a tragedy for the gay community because their culture was so based on, on they didn't say it this way, but basically indiscriminate sex. And <laughs> like, I don't think that's gonna win you too many friends. Um, but, you know, my dad, as it turned out, was a, his, his specialty was allergy and immunology. Um, in most places, HIV is, um, goes under infectious disease, but in his hospital, the infectious disease experts had no interest whatsoever in taking this on, so he took it on. And uh, um, he used to tell all these stories about 
you know, the, for the first three years or so, everybody died. Everybody died within a year of diagnosis because they just really didn't know how to diagnose it until you were already sick and they didn't know what to do about it once you were. And he went to, and my dad hates funerals anyway, but he went to more funerals than he want to think about. He and my mom would go to the gay pride ball and be the only mixed couple on the dance floor. But, um, and then when he finally retired at age 70, he started volunteering with Doctors Without Borders and he would go out to, you know, and the first, first pressing was he spent a year in Thailand teaching the doctors there how to use the AIDS drugs. Thailand, as it turns out, quite an enlightened country. They provide AIDS drugs for anybody who needs them. Now, it's not every drug in the world, but it's, they have a, a, a what do you call it, a, a formulary of AIDS drugs that they will provide to anybody who, who needs them. As opposed to, then, he, then another thing he did was China. And in China, they wanted every drug that was available to the Americans, even if only one out of 50 people could actually get them. So it's a different philosophy. Um, but he's been, he's now 95 and he's not going anywhere, but, but, uh, he's been all over the world, um, doing AIDS work, not, you know, in, re not Doctors Without Borders refugee camp kind of stuff, but, but, um, in, in, um, settings where they're maybe not used to this, uh, used to the drugs or used to what tests you can do or, and since my dad is older, he, he knows how to do things without MRI machines and, and necessarily having the first the first level uh, or the third level testing and everything. So, Marie, tell me about your decision to move over to UCLA. Um, well, like I said, the uh, my mentor and his boss were getting into kind of an ugly fight about me or or about something my mentor wanted to do, which my boss was trying, or his boss was trying to inject me in the, into the middle of. I was a little ticked off at USC because I had had a baby and they, um, excuse me, they basically wound up taking all of my vacation time away um, without telling me they were gonna do it. So, <laughs> um, and then UCLA came calling and so I, was amenable to going over and talking to them. Um, you know, I think USC was kind of too big and too political and, you know, would not have been the most comfortable place to stay for me. UCLA Westwood was uncomfortable the other way. They were so focused on everybody having NIH grants, which wasn't going to happen for me, that it was just like, you know, I'm going to become the, the, the lowly water carrier here. Um, the, and so I, I moved down to Harbor and the nice thing about Harbor was nobody cared if you were on the clinical track or not. Mm -hmm. And at UCLA, just to sort of understand why this is important at UCLA, if you're on the tenure track, you have an item, uh, which means that the university pays the first part of your salary and on the clinical track, at least in the medical school that you don't have a, a an item. So you're paying your own salary from your um, patient billings from, from the first dollar. And the the you're paying it after the dean takes whatever it is he thinks he needs, which sometimes they don't tell you until after the year's over. So <laughs> it's it's a little confusing you know, to figure out even how much money you're making. Um, so it is weird. I, I went out in private practice and I didn't think of myself as poorly compensated when I was at the county, but I went to private practice and by the second year was making double the amount of money um, just because partly, but even, even so the, the patients I was seeing were still mostly Medi-Cal patients. It wasn't like I was you know, seeing a lot of expensive Mrs. Gotrocks. It was just that I wasn't, I wasn't carrying all of the administrative stuff that I had previously been, been paying for. How did your, your medical career change as a result of moving over? Um, well, like I said, I, 
I basically, I stopped doing research immediately. I started doing, um, I was trying doing some uh, resident teaching and, and student teaching, which I really enjoyed for a while. Um, but at some point uh, during the pandemic, that also fell off just because uh, for a variety of reasons. And um, in 2016, I broke my hip and uh, I have never really gotten back to full time ever since then. Uh, partly because for a while I wasn't really physically able. And after that, I was like, I don't need to do this full time. <laughs> I'm getting too old to be working 12 hour days five days a week, you know? So, um, so I sort of, I sort of backed off quite a bit at that point, but um, it's, you know what they say, growing old is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, over the past 15 years, no medical, no, no insurance company has made any money off of me. <laughs> so, uh, Marie, for the last part of our talk, I'd like to ask a few retrospective questions, then we'll end looking sure. to the future. So have you been uh, um, an engaged alumnus of Caltech over the years? Have you followed what's been happening on campus since you graduated? Pretty much. Um, do you know what the Nomi Club is? No. Um, the Nomi Club, I think it used to be one of the original, they weren't really houses, but you know, they were, they were dining groups or whatever. Um, but when they built the new houses, the Nomis went, um, became a, um, uh, alumni honor society kind of, uh, so the Nomi club founders night is March 9th. They always have a dinner, usually in the Athenaeum. Um, my husband and I are both members. I, it doesn't take a lot to be a member. Um, so we go frequently. There was a point in time when um, I was the president of the Nomi Club, um, and uh, that was a long time ago. It was when one of my kids who were now in their thirties, one of them was a baby. But <laughs> uh, and then for uh, that one point, I used to sit on the committee, the alumni association committee that uh, uh, organized a uh, 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 seminar day. Um, which was really, so one year, it, it, this is one of these things where the alumni society staff would have everything organized and they would say, okay, you two guys are in charge of biology. Go talk to the chair of biology and he'll tell you which, which two people are going to give the talks for this year. Okay. I can do that. And then you'd stand up and introduce professor so-and-so who's giving his talk. But then one year I was the president of the committee and the president's job is to pick or help to pick the, um, the person who gives the, uh, the, the big talk and Beckman and also um, to introduce that person. So this was when Dr. Baltimore was the, uh, uh, what is the president? And uh, I said, we should talk about um, gene sequencing. Um, I forget. I forget what it was. Maybe it was stem cells. Anyway, everybody else wanted. You know, they they always want to talk about whatever lander landed on whichever planet or moon most recently. <laughs> and so that's which is fine, except that after a while, you've done it three years in a row. It's like it's time to talk about something else. So, and everybody else in the committee was like, oh, no, this is too weird and esoteric. And then California passed a, a law or a, a resolution saying that because the government wasn't going to fund this stuff, that California was going to fund stem cell research. And then everybody was like, well, maybe this isn't such a bad idea. And then uh, um, Dr. Baltimore wanted to give the talk. I don't know if you've ever heard him give a talk, like yeah. at Seminar Day. It's, I can sit there and I'm supposed to know this stuff and I have a hard time following what's going on. <laughs> and, and uh, but they decided it was actually hilarious. There was, and I can't, I wish I could remember the guy's name. There's a guy from Stanford who was a friend of Baltimore's came down and Baltimore interviewed him. And that was the, the, um, the 
presentation about stem cell research and what this meant, and, da, da, da. and then they had um, they passed up uh, questions from the audience. And one of the questions from the audience was, this was when George W. Bush was the president, they were outlawing stem cell research and all this stuff. And they said, uh, considering our current government, do you think the United States risks falling behind uh, countries with smarter leaders? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like you can't make this stuff up yeah. <laughs> and but the actually for me the best part about this was that um i get they have a luncheon afterwards um at the president or i'm sure they probably do this every year at the president's house for um the plenary speaker and the uh um the what is it the what do they call the alums that win the prize? Um, distinguished uh, alumnus. Distinguished awards. alums, yeah. Okay. So one of the distinguished alums was this uh, Japanese American guy. And his story was that his education was not wonderful. I think he got sent away to the camps during World War II. He, um, so he comes back and he's working in Pasadena as a gardener. But he got injured or something, he couldn't work for a while. So he wanted to come and sit in on classes at Caltech. And he goes in to talk to Max Delbrook about sitting in on his course. And Max says, tell me your story. And the guy tells him his story. And the guy, and Delbrook talked the rest of the faculty in the Department of Biology into accepting him as a student. And so, so he went through Caltech as a student. He became a, a again, a professor at Stanford. Unfortunately, by the time I met him, he was, his memory was going, but it was still, it was just such a great, and it was so Caltech. It was so, you know, you don't need to have test scores. We, we know that you know what you're doing, you know, just be a student and we'll figure it out. And uh, uh, that to me was really the difference between Caltech and a lot of the other more prestigious universities was that so much of what got you a space at Harvard was had nothing really to do with what you wanted, yeah, you know, how you wanted to study or what you wanted to study. It was, you know, what did you know? Did your grandfather go here? Um, did you do impressive things like uh, build houses on um, for you know for poor people? Not that that's a bad thing to do, but just. Um, it's all about how you present yourself and not about what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and Caltech, it was all kind of like, yeah, you know, if you're right, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Marie, there's such an obvious connection between your medical education and your medical career, but what about your education at Caltech? Has there been an approach to the science, a way of looking at the data an approach with your academic colleagues that stayed with you throughout your career? You know, it's... I think the biggest thing is, is to actually look at things and say, is there evidence? Yeah, in medicine, you got to all the time do stuff where you don't have good evidence for what's the right thing to do, but at least to acknowledge that that's what's going on. Um, because it, you have to kind of keep yourself ready to change everything you do when the evidence comes in the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the guy I have worked with for the past well over 20 years now, um, who was the chairman of the department at the time when I mentioned that there was some upheaval in the department um, for sort of unobvious reasons, uh, is actually a graduate of MIT. <laughs> so, <laughs> although he says, oh, all that quantitative stuff, I hated MIT, you know. <laughs> so, um, but I think 
I think that as compared with a lot of people, I've always been more interested in looking at the numbers, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the, at the, how many people do you actually have? How, how well do you know this? Do you even know it? You know, or is, is it, um, and I think those are, the, those are the kind of things that have, that, that have stayed with me from Caltech that a lot of people, even, even a lot of doctors, they spent so much time studying, doing, um, humanities that, you know, have you ever heard how these people, you know, complain about, you know, scientists, you haven't read the great books, you haven't done the cultural things. And you look at them and you're going like, you can't balance your checkbook. Why is that not a disabling <laughs> problem? You know, it's, it's, it, if you think about the great thinkers of the past, you know, Leonardo and Newton had much more in common with each other than, than not, you know, that, that, that they were interested in how things worked and it didn't really matter how you, what educational wrapping you put around that. And, and that's, that's what I think we've lost a lot is that, is that we've decided that there's a science box and there's a humanities box and there's an art box and they're all, all different boxes and they're not, they all bleed into each other. Marie, finally, last question, looking to the future, whenever you feel the time is right to transfer from 75% retirement to full-time retirement. What will that look like and what opportunities might you have to be active in different ways? Um, I've been, re I've really been trying to retire. My, my business partner is not ready to let me go because he doesn't have anybody else who can do some of the things I do. But, um, you know, there are a couple of things. I, you know, I now have four grandchildren who live in San Francisco. I'd really like to be able to spend more time with them. Maybe even move up there at some point. Although I haven't really thought about that. At the moment, we decided to do that. At least one of them will decide to move someplace else. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have a, I have a grandson who is, he is so funny. He is four years old. He can tell you about every dinosaur in the world. We took him to, you know, one of these um, airplane um, mausoleums where they, you know, they have old airplanes from, and he's going around telling the docents about the different airplanes. And, and um, he just, he has so many enthusiasms and he's so excited about everything. And he's so good about remembering things and wanting to learn more about things. And, and he's just hilarious. Um, but I, you know, I have a lot of sort of hobbies that I'd like to get back to more. And, you know, my, I, I know that I'm not doing a great deal work related anymore, but every year it just gets harder. You know, it, it gets harder to get up and, and, you know, I can't, I can't work overnight and then all, the whole next day the way I used to be able to do. I now have trouble working the next day if I spend 12 hours in the first day. So um, it's time, it's time to slow down a little bit. Um, the, you know, it's, it's being a doctor is one of those, uh, it becomes, it becomes life defining. I will always be a doctor, but um, what I do now is not so incredibly uh, irreplaceable that I would feel guilty about stopping doing it. I don't have any great desire to, um, you know, like write the, the great novel or, or try to write the wrongs of the universe. I should, I feel like I should have more of those feelings, but I don't. Um, but I'd like to spend more time with family. I'd like to spend more time um, just trying to finish up the 14 unfinished projects that I have lying around the house. <laughs> oh man. I have a baby blanket that I've been working on for about five years and I got to get it done before the last one of my nieces has her last kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, 
Um, and, you know, I, I think you talk, you talked to Debbie, we have a Celtic women's group that meets by zoom every um, month. I think they, they're finally back to meeting in real life, which would be real, a lot of fun. Um, but it's a, it's just one of the, one of the things about up till now is that we don't make a lot of friends outside of the, the work environment. It'd be nice to have some friends that are, that are different. It sounds like in retirement, you're going to be one of those people who's way busier than you are even now. Maybe. Um, but it's also just that, that, um, you know, I find, I find about half the mornings I wake up and I'm not ready for anything. I'm, you know, <laughs> and, uh, um, I don't have any trouble with my hip anymore, but my knees are starting to give me trouble. I had, I had an aunt who I think had two knees and one hip replaced and I think I'm going there. So we'll, we'll see. Um, that was one of those being a doctor things. I actually got to diagnose my own hips, hip fracture. Uh -huh. Um, but but that, that actually was kind of fun. It was like, oh, you know, <laughs> it's not subtle. Yeah. Um, but, but it's, uh, you know, my husband and I, both of our mothers are gone. Our fathers are both well into their nineties and, you know, we're hitting 70 pretty soon. And it's just, you start to feel it. Mm -hmm. You know, all those people who say 70 is the, is the new 40 are fooling themselves. It's, it's not, it, it's maybe 70 is the new 50, but, or, but, um, people used to, people used to retire and die within five years and that's not happening anymore. So. Well, maybe the best thing is your partner really needs to find somebody who can replace you because yeah, you've got well, some things it's, to it's, do. The answer to that is it's not going to happen. And at some point I'm going to have some other health deal. And I'm just going to say, no, I got to go. Well, you know? or you could be proactive and just do I it beforehand. Be. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, um, but that's kind of where we're going. It's funny. He has a, he has now a granddaughter who's like about 18 months. So, but it's just, there's so much more fun when they can talk to you. Sure. You know? Sure. All right, so maybe in a couple months when, when this kid starts speaking, he'll understand more. Maybe, yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> Marie, this has been such a lovely conversation. I'm so glad we were able to do this. I'd like to thank you so much. Thank you.